the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, before I gave you the high sign, my, my body mic apparently is not working. Is that right? Are you hearing me okay from up here? Okay. <clears throat> There's a wonderful Christian writer named Frederick Beekner. Uh, who has written many books about uh, various aspects of Christian faith. And one of my favorites, I, I have most of them, one of my favorites is called Peculiar Treasures, a Biblical Who's Who. It's a collection of sh little short pieces about various characters in the Bible. And in the introduction, Beekner writes that when he started the book, it was his intention to, quote, shake a little of the dust off a lot of the moth-eaten old saints, prophets, potentates, and assorted sinners who roam through the pages of the Bible. But what I got from my presumption was exactly the reverse. Who did I think was moth -eaten? They were the ones who shook the dust off me. Unquote. This is what happens, this is what should happen, when we really pay attention to the Bible and see the humans who are there, just like all of us, flawed people in messy situations that are not neatly resolved. Not august, marbleized figures when we tiptoe around because they're in the Bible, and therefore holy, a different race of beings than we are somehow. In that way, we anesthetize ourselves against the Bible. We don't hear it, and we shut ourselves off from a source of life that is like no other. I wrote this sermon actually before uh, realizing that the collect for today was about paying attention to Holy Scripture, that we should read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the scripture that God caused to be written, it says, for our uh, search for eternal life. We do have to pay attention. We do have to pay attention. Sometimes there's a message that comes through loud and clear, and sometimes it's hard to hear, and we have to work at it. But there's always new life of one kind or another that's just waiting to be discovered. Today's passage from Judges is probably more in the hard to hear category. Partly because it does seem just a little moth -eaten. So in the interest of close attention, I'm going to give you a little background here to situate it, and then look briefly at, at what we heard today. The book of Judges covers a particular period in the history of the Jewish people about 3,000 years ago. Moses had brought the Hebrews out of Egypt into Canaan, which became Palestine. When Moses died, he appointed Joshua to be his successor. And when Joshua died, there was no single ruler of the Israelites until Saul was anointed king by the prophet Samuel. That was a period, that intervening period was about 150 years. And during that period, the 12 tri tribes of Israel lived together, but they were not unified. There was no government. They squabbled among themselves, which made them easier prey for surrounding people, like the Philistines. You hear a lot about the Philistines. This was the period of the Judges. The book of Judges as a whole can be seen as a repeated cycle. The Israelites do evil, turn away from God, so God delivers them into the hand of a foreign power who oppresses them. The Israelites then appeal to God for help, God hears them, raises up a leader to deliver them, and these leaders are the ones who are known as judges, like Samson was a judge, Gideon was a judge. The judge is successful, the people turn to God again, and there is peace. But when the judge dies, the people once more rebel against God, and the cycle repeats itself. That's, that's the book of Judges. So the judges all had a military role of one kind or another, but with one exception, they were not judges in the legal sense of the word. That one exception was Deborah, the central figure in today's reading. We hear that she sat under the palm of Deborah, and the Israelites came up to her for judgment. Deborah was exceptional also in several other ways. She's one of the great figures in the Old Testament. She was the only judge who was a woman. She was also one of the very few women in the Bible, there are only three others, who the Bible identifies as a prophet. She was also evidently a poet. Our reading today is the beginning of Judges chapter 4, which describes an adventure and a military victory for the Israelites. Chapter 5 is known as the Song of Deborah. It's a poem celebrating that victory, and it's also generally understood to be the oldest piece of writing in the Bible. And it's a poem that is as unique and enigmatic as its author herself seems to be.
Today's reading also identifies Deborah as the wife of Lapidoth. But this translation may be misleading. The Hebrew word Lapidoth means torch or lightning. And the word for wife also means woman. So the author of the story may actually simply be saying that Deborah is a woman of lightning, a woman of fire, which, given what we learn about her in this story and a couple of others, is at least as likely as that she was married to a guy named Lapidoth. This lectionary passage is hard to grasp, just sitting here in church listening to it, like we always do. One is, let's face it, the names. This, there's such a barrage of Hebrew names in these seven short verses, names of people and places, that it's almost like a parody of an Old Testament reading, and, and a minefield to the people who have to read it aloud. Flora, who uh, we were joking about, it. Flora, who was saying, you did great, Flora. Uh, Flora, who assigns the readings to the lectures, scheduled herself for the 8 o'clock today without knowing what she was in for. She will not make that mistake again, I'm sure. <laughs> Jabin, Hazor, Sisera, Harasheth Lagoyim, Barak, son of Abinoam from Kedesh in Naphtali. I mean, it's like a joke. We hear all this, and many of us just instinctively shut down. What can this possibly have to do with my life today? It's the Bible. These names may have meant something to people 2,000 years ago, but not now. This is moth It's hard to get past that. And then, too, what facts we do pick up from behind that thicket of names does not seem to amount to much. We get a couple of details about Deborah and the political situation at the time, and then we hear some simple instructions that she gives to Barak, who is evidently a military commander. And that's it. This is plainly, plainly the beginning of a story, but we don't hear the middle and the end. There's got to be more to it, but this is all we hear. Why? Well, what are we to make of what we do have today? Well, I think there are two things that emerge that are worth our attention. The first is that in this story, we see that God pays attention and responds to what his people do. The first two verses tell us that the Israelites, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, so, so the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan. How we behave, what we do, means something to God. Unfathomable as it may be, God gives us that respect. That's in the nature of covenant, an idea which is fundamental both to Jewish and Christian faith. God knows what is best for us better than we do. And when we turn away from God, there are going to be consequences. God does not arbitrarily punish people. Then in verse 3, verse 3, we learn that the Israelites turn back to God. They cry out to God for help. And God responds to that appeal through Deborah. This is how God acts, speaking and working through people. That's the reality of the Holy Spirit. This relates to the second thing that I think about this passage that's worth noting. God works through a woman to lead the Israelites. This was, to put it mildly, unusual. Israelite culture was patriarchal, and in the structure of society, women were powerless. But because of who Deborah was, because of the gifts God had given her, the gift of prophecy, and evidently, the gift of not listening to people who tell her what she can't do, these gifts enabled her to do God's work. In the Gospel lesson from Matthew today, we heard Jesus warn against burying a gift that God has given Deborah certainly put her gifts to work in a rich and powerful variety of ways. The rest of the story, which follows what we heard today, is in its way one of the great ones in the Bible. Barak, the Israelite commander, tells Deborah that he and his army will do what she asks, but only if she goes along with them. Evidently, he thinks that will guarantee his victory. She says she will. But she tells him that his victory will not be total, that Sisera, the enemy general, will meet his end at the hands of a woman. And that's what happens. Sisera's army is defeated, but he escapes, and he flees to the tent of a man who is not an Israelite, who he knows is friendly to him. And the man's wife, in jail, invites him in, tells him to have no fear, puts a blanket over him, waits till he's asleep, and then takes a tent peg and hammers it clean through his store. 
And this treachery and murder is celebrated in the poem Deborah writes to commemorate the victory. She calls Jael most blessed of women in the poem. Our Bible is written in crooked lines. God works in our real lives, yours and mine, the messiest, in the messiest, most confused and despairing places where we cannot believe that God would possibly stoop to go. Times change. Historical circumstances change. Patterns of human behavior change. But the fact of our separation from God will never change, not in this life. Nor will God ever stop trying to reach across to us to bring us home. That's the message that beats through the Bible from stem to stern, no matter how lofty it may sometimes seem to us. That's the story of the human race. May we always be listening for our placement. Thanks be to God. Amen.